So far, there's been a lot of emphasis on the history of science as a history of unifying ideas. In part two, I discussed some basic scientific principles, and we're going to see a lot more of that as we move quickly through the 19th century. In fact, the early 19th century saw some of the most important advances since Newton, but were not well understood by the pioneers working on them at that time. Only gradually, with seemingly unrelated things like electricity, magnetism, and light be unified into the electromagnetic spectrum. At around the same time, Carl Gauss, Nikolai Lobachevsky, and Janis Bolye would completely overturn 2,000 years of geometry. The significance of that development would not be well understood outside of pure mathematics until Einstein introduced it in his general theory of relativity nearly a century later in 1915 unifying both space and time into a new paradigm called space-time. But before we get ahead of ourselves, we need to consider that it was Antoine Lavoisier in the 18th century who established the first conservation law of physics. The universe is a perfectly closed system in which matter is neither created nor destroyed, only transformed from one form to another. Well, how could he possibly know such a thing? Well, he didn't. He merely surmised from the astonishing mathematics of his predecessors that for there to be a correspondence between mathematics and the universe, then we must regard the universe as a perfectly closed system. Why? Because formulas and equations are themselves perfectly closed systems. All of mathematics reduces to the special properties of zero and one. Therefore, mathematics can be regarded as the language of the universe, and we can test our ideas about the universe through careful experimentation with respect to mathematical principles. In effect, Lavoisier formally unified the contrasting views of Plato and Aristotle, but only for matter. In conducting highly precise experiments to prove this, he would become the father of modern chemistry and discover the unique properties of chemical elements and the process later known as oxidation. Our main focus at this point, however, is the relationship between energy and matter. In the 19th century, these two concepts had not yet been unified. Energy was a distinct and separate thing from matter and was manifest in light and heat which scientists considered to be the presence of some mysterious phantom substance that migrated through and around matter. There were many clever and convincing arguments for the existence of phlogiston, for example, but they failed to explain why some things actually gained mass after losing heat in some chemical reactions, which is what happened when Lavoisier passed steam through a gun barrel to separate water into its constituent elements. Some of the oxygen that was lost at the other end of the experiment reacted with the metal gun barrel. So Lavoisier later revised phlogiston theory to introduce another substance called caloric and applied the same conservation law to it that he had proposed for matter. So there were two distinct conservation laws, one for matter and one for energy. The universe is a perfectly closed system in which energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transformed from one substance to another. The final form of the first law was not yet realized until Einstein's energy mass equivalence in 1905, but we're still a long way from that discussion. At the age of only 17, Humphrey Davy would rub two ice cubes together to demonstrate that heat had nothing to do with phantom substances and instead resulted from the friction of molecules in motion. It would not be until 1824 that Nicholas Carnot would become the father of thermodynamics, which was described at the time as the study of efficiency. The science of the time was less concerned with a description of the universe than the more practical pursuit to get the most work out of the least expenditure of energy in an industrial age. But Carnot is now credited for establishing thermodynamics as a science, though he was largely unknown in his lifetime. And it would be Lord Kelvin and Rudolf Clausius who would later follow up and formalize the second law of thermodynamics and entropy.
Max Planck was born in 1858, just one year before Gustav Kirchhoff had established the concept of an ideal black body to better understand the movement of energy within and among substances, where a black body is a perfect absorber and emitter of radiation. Kirchhoff came to realize that the range and intensity of radiation given off by an ideal black body depended only on its temperature, not the material out of which it was made or the shape or any other factor. And this became Kirchhoff's law. He had thus reduced the problem to the pursuit for a formula involving only two variables, one for the temperature of the black body and the other for the wavelength of light it absorbs or emits. Unfortunately, the technical advances needed to arrive at this formula in a lab had not yet existed. By the 1880s, Planck had moved around between Munich and Berlin universities and was a student under Hermann Helmholtz and Kirchhoff. He found their lectures monotonous and boring and found greater inspiration from the work of Rudolf Clausius at Bonn University. Planck ascended to one of the most prestigious offices of science in Berlin University in 1888. In 1894, two of his superiors died and this elevated him to senior physicist at the age of 36. This made him the most influential living physicist of the time at a relatively young age. In the previous year, Planck's colleague Wilhelm Wien found a mathematical relationship where the wavelength of radiation emitted from a black body multiplied by its temperature is a constant. This was known as Wien's displacement law, where T is the absolute temperature, the Greek symbol lambda is wavelength, and lowercase b is Wien's constant, which links temperature and wavelength in an inverse relationship that is equal to 2.898 times 10 to the negative 3 meters Kelvin or 0.2898 centimeter Kelvin. Unfortunately, Wien's displacement law tended to overestimate the intensity of radiation at longer wavelengths than the experiments could produce. Nevertheless, it held true at shorter wavelengths and was an important connection that earned Wien a Nobel Prize in 1911. There was still, however, the problem of finding a constant that could explain all variations throughout the spectrum, and Planck's biggest obstacle to finding it was his unwillingness to believe in atoms which most scientists at the time simply regarded as a convenient mathematical fiction and not a property of nature. There was, of course, some truth in that, but it was a major controversy at the time, and we're not quite ready to start talking about what things are real and what things are not just yet. Planck was simply at a dead end until he reluctantly began to consider atoms as real things in the world and apply Ludwig Boltzmann's statistical mechanics, which emphasized the relationship between the entropy and probability distributions of particles in a system. Up until now, we've been talking about heat, light, and energy, which had been regarded as wave-like, and Planck now found it necessary to think of these things as particles. And worse yet, they were particles devoid of mass. It was hard enough to take seriously the notion of matter being comprised of atoms, much less the existence of particles that have no mass at all. Planck was left with only one option. He needed a formula that was discrete and binary rather than fluid and continuous, and this led to the most consequential formula in modern science, E equals HF where the energy absorbed or emitted from a black body came in these HF-sized chunks. 1HF, 2HF, 3HF, etc. And that was the birth of quantum physics, where light is comprised of photons representing the most basic unit in physics and can only be described as a wavicle or a thing-slash-event. Planck, however, had not yet realized the significance of his own discovery. It just rubbed him the wrong way because it completely defied the common sense of the time to think of light and energy as discrete particles. What convinced everyone was the discovery of the ultraviolet catastrophe, also known as the Rayleigh genes catastrophe, 
Lord Rayleigh and James Jeans employed a classical description of absorption and emission that was supposed to produce the result Planck was looking for. Despite the fact that it was a flawless application of Newtonian mechanics, it predicted the emission of an infinite amount of energy in the ultraviolet range, which effectively disproved Newtonian mechanics as a description of the universe more generally. In other words, Newton's physics could not explain light bulbs. Over the previous two centuries, the amazing usefulness of Newtonian physics and 2,000 years of Euclidean geometry had both been disproven in the same century as having any resemblance to reality. At the beginning of the 20th century, the scientific world found itself having to start all over again from the beginning, much the same way that we saw Kepler having to do in part one. If this all seems confusing, which I'm sure it does, don't worry. In part four, we're going to narrow our focus to the flurry of developments between 1900 and the early 1930s.